Hi. Hey, Emily. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm great. Could you um, could you help me with something real quick? Yes. Yes. I have a PowerPoint, but I have two monitors, and I always get tripped out about which okay. one it needs to be on. So I'm just gonna play from start, and if you could tell me which screen you see. Yeah. Um. Okay, screen sharing ability. Right. Okay. So. So if I'm screen sharing here, yeah, and then I go play from start. Which screen do you see? Um, the the uh, um your quote. Okay, H awesome. Nelson Mandela. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. Great. So maybe I should just keep that on, or should I wait until you intro? Um. Whatever you want to do, um, it doesn't matter. We can just keep that on, um, or we can just wait until after the introduction. Okay, Whatever. yeah, I'll just wait. Now that, now that I know, okay. I always... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it seems to always kind of flip. <laughs> At least, yeah, it works now, so we're good. Um, I guess we can, we'll start in about 10 minutes, because I'm assuming everyone's just coming back from the networking, which is really cool. Yeah, okay. But did you, okay. were you part of that? Did you... No, I actually okay. I'm at work right now. It's been a little bit of a crazy oh. day. But I was I was on this morning on the panel. Yes. yes so I will yeah. And I could double back and get some of the uh recorded sessions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the format for this roughly mm -hmm. is after you intro me, I have about 15 minutes or so to present. Yeah. Okay, and then so I'll basically not cut you off, but I'll just like uh stop and then basically people will just ask questions and then mm -hmm. you'll answer them and then you'll have the rest of the session just to continue your presentation and then it yeah. will just close with a couple more questions if anyone has anything and then that is it okay yes and then my, my other question was going to be how big are the breakout groups because based on how many people we have yeah so it just depends because everyone can come in and out of the session. So they could go to room A, room B, B, room C. They can go in and out. So it honestly just depends on that. So it might fluctuate throughout your presentation. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then in the breakout rooms themselves, yeah. that's just questions that I'm answering. Yeah. So in the chat, so uh, basically I'll just be reading you the questions. And it, we're oh. staying in this whole, sorry, we're staying in this whole like facility for this um, portion. The questions are not, it's just gonna be breaked. I'm just gonna break after 15 minutes to ask some questions and that's about it. Sounds exciting. Yes. W were you in the networking session? Mm -hmm. It was very, you don't realize how fast three minutes is until you join the <laughs> networking session and you're mid sentence and then it just cuts you off and I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. So. If I was there, I'd be like cop. I'd be like copying and pasting my social media <laughs> handle. Like, wait, uh, yeah, right and click. then just copy, copy. <laughs> yep, mm -hmm. yep. Okay. It's a cloudy day outside, so I'm happy that this is happening today and not a nice sunny day. Right, right. This has been very... Yeah, it's, it's a weird one out here in Nova Scotia as well. Yeah. The weather's been getting warm, but then also, like, we had a record high and then mm -hmm. 27 centimeters of snow, like, the following day, so wow. I don't know what to expect. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to snow here on Wednesday, so who knows what's going to happen, but that's okay. The snow can stay. And where are you in terms of the COVID stuff? Like what, what zone are you on? And um, so I'm in, I am in Burlington right now. So we're going into the gray, gray zone. Um, I honestly just don't leave my house. <laughs> so I am very isolated. I'm very, I think, yeah. So, but London is changed. It's not in the gray zone, so. It's different. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Okay. 
Okay, well, I guess we can just get started, um, maybe. I'm cool with that. Just so then you have ample amount of time and then you can ask questions and just everyone is good to go. Okay, so welcome. Pretty me. I said, I kind of wish I could see people. I know we can't because of the phone. But. Yeah, I know. It's nice to see more than just us, but that's okay. Um, okay, so welcome to the first speaker session of the afternoon. My name is Emily Meriden, and I am a member of the Western Mustangs golf team. So this session will last about 40 minutes with the speaker taking a break at 15 minutes to answer a few questions and then return to the presentation and we'll conclude with a few more questions. And I encourage you to use the chat function to generate conversation and question. And this will basically be how you communicate. So only presenters and moderators, so myself, will have access to the audio and visual components. So please use the chat function. Just ensure that the session chat is selected to communicate and ask questions throughout the session. So this being said, I am pleased to welcome you all to the path to being a sport activist. Led by Lee Anna Osse, Lee Anna is the founder and director of the Black Canadian Coaches Association and has founded the Can Lead Sports, a non-for-profit organization that supports and empowers the continued presence of women in sport. A former U Sports and NCAA basketball superstar, Lee Anna is now the head coach of the women's basketball team at St. Francis Xavier University in Nova Scotia. She is also the instructor in the Department of Human Kinetics at St. FX. She's passionate, passionate about gender and racial equality, as well as leadership through sports. And in recent news, Leanna has been named one of the top 30 most influential Canadian women in sports by the Toronto Star. So in, during this session today, Leanna will share her experiences and explain the further the pathway to becoming a sport activist. So we are so pleased to have you, and I will just turn the floor over to you to begin your presentation. Thanks a lot for the kind uh, introduction, Emily. Yeah, when you said when you said superstar, that re that, re that really touched me. I know yeah. some of my teammates that have something to say about that. Um, I wanted to start off uh, by just thanking everyone for joining us today. I also wanted to give a land acknowledgement. Uh, I'm tuning in from uh, from Nova Scotia, and so I want to acknowledge the Mi'kmaq. Um, community um, and from which uh, we, sit, we sit and uh, we operate on the unceded territory of their lands. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I want to do a quick little icebreaker. I call it a snowball. So when COVID hit, you know, a lot of coaches had to start getting really creative in terms of how we kept our, our student athletes engaged. So anyways, this snowball is just going to help uh, Emily and I know where you guys are tuning in from. So if possible, I'd like you to write down like what sport uh, you're affiliated with or have been affiliated or even like and where you're tuning in from. And how the snowball works is I'm gonna count down from three and you're, and you're gonna click enter. So you can start typing now and I'll count down from three, two, one. London track, Toronto Athletics, Volleyball Oakville, <laughs> washed up b-ball player, Living in Toronto, figure skating, cool from London, Saskatoon track and field, hey Mavis, soccer, Edmonton, all must all Mustang sports, yes for the multi sport volleyball, and rugby. Thanks so much, guys. I know we can't really see each other face to face, but I think it's just awesome to kind of get that going. Been to um, into this presentation, and I'm uh, gonna screen share. Fingers crossed here, everything goes well and play from start. So I wanted to start off uh, today with this really, really cool quote uh, that I had always, I wouldn't say I always heard it, but it's something that I would say in the last three or four years has started to speak to me more and more and more. Uh, it's a quote from Nelson Mandela um, and it reads, sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. It is more powerful than governments in breaking down racial barriers. It laughs in the face of all types of discrimination. So today, I know I'm talking to you guys about pathways to being a sports advocate, 
uh, the first half of our discussion, I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself, um, which to be honest, I wish I could talk about everyone else that I've been in contact with and I've been able to network with and learn from, but that'll be the first bit. And the second bit, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about just different types of advocacy and how that has manifested itself in our Canadian sport community through some of the platforms uh, that I've been fortunate enough to work with. But this quote, I think really speaks to my own journey through sport um, and um, even more so I would say today. Okay, so who am I? Everyone knows me as Coach Lee. Um, my mother uh, was an immigrant. She came to Canada in the 70s. Uh, she knew little to no English. Uh, she had a fourth grade education, um, couldn't write. And uh, she also was pregnant with one of my eldest brothers. And uh, we had, lo we had uh, relocated, at the time I wasn't born of course, but um, we had lived in the Jaden Finch community. Uh, and a lot of my upbringing was really centered around faith um, and just discipline, like faith and discipline. And very early on in my community, uh, we, we, weren't in, we weren't in the best community, I would say, for recreational supports and, and safety in some cases. Uh, and because of that, I, you know, I was trying to find something to do. I, I had always been very active. And so I, I naturally went to sports, right? And kind of thinking back to that, to that quote, like sport is just something that acts as a tool for people to come together. Um, and I was a little bit of, a, of an enigma, I would say, because like right off the bat, I just always wanted to hang out with the boys. And um, I grew up in a, uh, in a family with two older brothers. And so everything was a hand-me-down. And so in my mind, I always saw myself as just kind of the third brother. That's what it felt like as a middle child. Um, but when I really started to participate in sport through my grade school years, um, it wasn't it wasn't something that was accepted in in the home because it didn't tie into kind of those disciplines of uh, being a faith based person, um, being very diligent academically, even at a young age, uh, and then just doing things like a girl should do. And if there's anyone on our call that uh, grew up in a West African household or uh, with similar cultural traditions. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's a huge, it's a huge barrier, I would say, uh, for women in sport coming from, coming from a, a household uh, like that. Uh, but nonetheless, I was able to participate in sport, um, often being the only girl. I, I actually remember um, being in eighth grade and uh, we had moved up to Vaughn and uh, I, I'd been, uh, up to that point, I'd always been around other students who looked like me uh, in a really diverse area. Uh, in west in the west end of Toronto, and moving up to Vaughan, uh, this was back when, I mean, there was no sidewalks, uh, there were no bus systems, there was not anything, and I found that you know, as a young woman in that even in that sport context, it was something that again I had to battle with. Uh, so I remember I remember my first days of school, and you know, just during recess, trying to play some basketball. And it's like, whoa, hold on a second, you know, why aren't you skipping? Why aren't you doing this and that? And I'm like, well. Why? Why would? Why wouldn't I be playing basketball? Uh, and so these are the things I kind of, uh, I, I kind of fondly think back on when I think about being a sports advocate, but also being a woman in sport and a woman of color um, through that sport environment. Uh, throughout my high school years, and uh, yeah, my real, my real formative years, uh, basketball really provided me an opportunity to to learn from different people in the community, to make friends. Uh, I don't know where I would be. Uh, if I didn't have before school started and after school uh, programs, um, coming from a family that didn't have a lot of dollars, tied to a lot of our sport programming was kind of meals. And that was also something that was kind of hard to come by at times. And so um, for some of those that, some of those, uh, for some of our, um, our teachers and our coaches, uh, they'd have like a breakfast program or an after school program and try to help us out. I was really fortunate enough to, to excel um, in, in playing basketball as much as I did academically. And, um, with that, I was, I was afforded a couple of opportunities, uh, to pursue, uh, my post-secondary career in the States. And so I started at the University of Miami and, uh, some people ask me why I went to the U and to be quite honest with you, it was to, it was to get as far away from snow as possible. Uh, that's, <laughs> that, that was, that pretty much was a deal, was a deal breaker for me. Um, but throughout high school, the challenge of 
uh, balancing school. I wouldn't even say it was a challenge. I, I only had school and basketball and I didn't really have much else. I was, um, I was estranged from my family. Um, I was on welfare and actually my former um, high school coach uh, moved out of his home so I could live with his mother who at the time was, um, was um, battling cancer and going through chemotherapy. And uh, that really got me through, uh, through that sport connection, that really got me through high school, uh, to be quite honest. And it's something that I'm uh, extremely grateful for. Uh, but I took that opportunity and I went to the States for a few years. Uh, and then I would say uh, in 2012, uh, that's kind of when my life changed. I've always had an older brother. And again, owing to some of my cultural traditions, um, my brother was, was always heralded as kind of like our family hero. And he was, a re he was a good guy. You know, he was like a, any older brother. Um, never really played any sport, was extremely gifted, was identified pretty early on. Uh, he ended up uh, attending Gloria University, graduated top of his class. I think he scored in like the top five percentile in the province for his CA exam, started working in the corporate world. And my mother had reached out to me because um, he was having some health issues. And um, at the time, as, as I mentioned, I, uh, I hadn't been connected with my family for a few years. Uh, and so, you know, I prayed about it and uh, I was in a transition stage of, you know, do I finish off my last two years in the States or do I kind of pick up and head back home? And so I, um, I made the decision to head home. Uh, and, you know, this was the 2012, 2011, 2012 year, but this was probably my most uh, tumultuous year because uh, through this year, my brother's uh, mental health went on a serious decline and uh, we had a lot of issues in our home. Uh, and unfortunately, um, it, it culminated with, with, with him taking his own life. And as challenging and difficult as that year was, um, my mother at the time actually was, uh, was in the States when it happened and I had to call and, and, and tell her what happened. Um, and it was, it was, I mean, it's something that still seems surreal, still seems like it was yesterday. Um, but if there's one thing I could remember from uh, that year that my, that my brother left us, it was his encouragement uh, for me as a young black female uh, to be that representation for other young women uh, who wanted to follow in my steps uh, or, or other West African household families or any parents who are looking for support or any prospective athletes that are looking for uh, pathways uh, to continue their involvement in sport. He actually gave me my first uh, $100 uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to start my first business, which is, which is Can Lead Sports. It's an organization, as Emily had mentioned, that's really um, devoted to enhancing those pathways and specifically for basketball uh, for many young women in the Ontario region. Uh, in honor of my brother, I decided to um, attend Wilfrid Laurier University and I was really fortunate enough to play there. Uh, I think a big shift for me, again, we go back to that, to that amazing quote from Nelson Mandela. I remember um, going into that summer, my brother had passed away right at the end of summer, right at the end of August, but going into that summer period, I wasn't even totally sure I wanted to continue playing sport. You know, in my mind, well, I'm not a fully scholarship athlete anymore. And, you know, now I'm in this phase of, of working and, and helping out at home and trying to kind of figure some things out. And uh, Coach Falco at the time at Laurier was talking to me a little bit about the program. My brother had actually helped me uh, apply uh, uh, there at Laurier. And when he had passed away, I, I only knew uh, one person on the team and uh, that was Doreen. And I actually grew up with Doreen in the, in the, in the exact same housing complex in that Jane and Finch area and her family had, had left as well um, uh, due, to, due to a lot of, um, but the whole team actually drove down from Waterloo, Ontario uh, to Toronto for my brother's funeral. And uh, it, it single, it, it in many ways, is something that is always kind of entrenched in my mind as to kind of going back to, again, what basketball has been able to afford me. And uh, this team right here was my support system uh, through a really, really challenging uh, time. And I was, uh, you know, it was the best decision I ever made uh, to surround myself uh, with my with my Laurier Golden Hawks family. Um, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to play. We were a nationally ranked team, top five, I think, by the last two years, we went to nationals. I was named an OUA All-Star and academically, um, I had a, an incredible time as well. I followed in my brother's footsteps to become uh, the second uh, graduate in our family. Um, and then I was able to do a one-year master's. 
Um, and as I mentioned in 2012, uh, before my brother had passed, he, he had encouraged me um, to really be that representation. And I found when I came back from the States, there were a lot of, um, there were a lot of kind of gaps in terms of access to, to, uh, to sports. And, and in so many ways, I mean, I was working with Ontario basketball and I was helping with some talent identification and specifically I was in a lot of the marginalized communities. And so it allowed me to informally kind of be this liaison that could open up opportunities. Um, when we established Canleats, so Canleats is a Canadian athlete, so kind of a mix of the, of the two words. Uh, we used it uh, to create a platform where we can have events and where we can market the women's game. Cause I found um, there was just a lot going on on the boys side. I had started off coaching uh, while I was while I was in high school at Eastern, and so I I was really familiar with the guys' side, but there were, there was just nothing on the side uh, for girls basketball, and so I was working with organizations like Jewel, I as I mentioned Ontario Basketball, North Pole Hoops, and really trying to just um, step up uh, step up and be that representation for the girls' side, and so that was uh that was in 2012 there. And then owing to that, um, I started to segue into more of a sport leadership role. So I had uh, finished my career at Laurier. Um, I was doing my master's and I was like, okay, I still want to be involved in what ways. And it was actually another female and the only woman of color uh, that I knew at that time in my, in, my, um, in my basketball connections that opened up the door for me to coach with our provincial team. And you know, if, if anybody who, who's on the calls in the basketball space, like playing for Team Ontario or doing anything with Team Ontario, like that was where you wanted to be. Like that just was the gold standard. You know, I think that's, I think a lot of it has changed now because there's so many different uh, groups and organizations and opportunities. Um, but, you know, it was an amazing transition for me. Um, part of it also led me to uh, grow my networking circle. And I found myself employed as a full-time um, high performance coach at uh, TRC Academy in Bradford, Ontario. And so uh, that's uh, on the bottom left, there's a picture of uh, the phenomenal young women that I was able to coach and, um, and, uh, and work with over the course of that year. Uh, and throughout that process of kind of really growing can leads, um, being a little bit more visible, I found that I was able to help other young women and other families. And uh, I, you know, I have so many memories of, of specifically African families um, and, and young women saying, Coach Lee, can you talk to my parents? You know, they don't think it makes sense for me to, uh, to play sports. They don't see what the point of it is. I still remember those conversations. Uh, but I also remember, you know, talking to a lot of families and giving them some support from a recruitment standpoint. So having played at the Division One level, having played at the Division One junior college level, and then finally finishing my career at the U sport level, it, it offered me a different kind of lens in terms of, you know, what is it that you're trying to accomplish in sport? Like I said, for me, I always wanted to be a coach. Uh, and then how do we work backwards um, from, that, from that standpoint? Um, but just really being attentional again about providing those opportunities. In 2018-19, I was uh, really, really blessed and um, I was hired as the head coach of women's basketball at St. FX University uh, in Nova Scotia, Canada. And so the year prior is when I was at uh, TRC Academy uh, coaching at the prep level. Uh, and, you know, like God works in such mysterious ways because at the time we were in our off season uh, for TRC kind of gearing up for year two. And we had a phenomenal turnout with our program in terms of placing kids at, um, at, a, at mainly American, but also Canadian universities. We had some national team athletes. Um, we probably averaged about a hundred uh, division one coaches come into our institutions and I had some job offers. And part of what I struggled with was, you know, I, I, I know that part of my purpose is helping to grow our sport capacity here in, in, uh, in Canada. And I felt that going back to the States wasn't the right decision for me. At the same time, um, I loved what I did, but I, but I really wasn't working for any money um, in, in kind of my role in, in, in working at, at that prep school level. And so it made it challenging. Again, as a first generation, I've got a lot of OSAP debt, um, but, I'm, but I'm absolutely loving what I do. And uh, my family actually had an intervention with me and they were kind of like, Lee, you know, you've, 
you've been able to support so much um, in terms of creating pathways. And you know, why don't you just think about getting a real job, right? And uh, in our keynote today, for those of you that were on, Jada was talking a little bit about like when you get to a certain age or a certain time frame, and you kind of start getting those questions. So what's next? Like, what is sport really going to do for you? And um, and again, I prayed about it, and uh, and you know, I also agreed. I said, you know what? My passion for sport is not limited to the level I coach at. You know, as long as I can be involved in, in any capacity. Um, I'm going to be happy with what I'm doing, um, but, you know, making those sacrifices for family. Uh, and so ultimately, I started looking for jobs. And um, in a in a really, really <laughs> strange way, uh, I had three different people in my life in three different capacities tell me about this job opportunity. And so I interviewed for St. FX University. I interviewed uh, for UPEI. And ultimately, like, I just thought this was an amazing opportunity to kind of be a uh, professional coach, U Sports, obviously being um, the largest employer of professional coaches in the country. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't think I could do it. Um, I knew I was coming in, and I was also uh, the first female that the school's ever hired um, as a varsity coach. And you know what would that mean? Um, I knew I was trying to come and rebuild a program, uh, and so you know, just getting ready to roll my sleeves up. But I would say this was a huge turning point uh, for me because I think I went from you know high performance athlete to high performance coach and then in making this jump to the U sport level it really switched my lens in terms of what it means to really lead um lead in sport and lead through sport so with that i guess i'm going to pause cuz i know we've got a a format that we're following yes perfect so you have your first question uh, so the first question is, what advice would you provide to current players on how to get involved in sport, either as a coach or in another role? My my advice would be, don't afraid to network in as many ways as possible. Um, I remember when I, I remember in 2012 when I came back uh, from the States, I had this agreement with my mother. The agreement was I wasn't going to return to school right away. I was going to eat. Uh, I was going to work for a year and I was <laughs> working these really sketchy factory gigs uh, to help with uh, some bills at home while my brother was sick. Um, but I was like, I want to put myself out there to any and everyone. And so whether it was going to Humber College for Team Canada basketball camp, whether it was, you know, I was part journalist for North Pole Hoops covering some of their stories. I was doing a lot of skill development and training, um, but I was, I put a lot more effort and time into trying to understand what is available in this landscape for those pathways. So I think networking um, is, a, is a huge part of that and uh, the outreach component as well. So then through that, um, what was the hardest lesson that you have learned when developing uh, these skills and then even with your businesses that you run? <laughs> <laughs> the hardest lesson? I think, so I will say this, I think I've been very fortunate that the people that I've met have been just incredibly kind-hearted people. Uh, and up to this point, like everyone that has been in my circle and even as an acquaintance has, has just been incredibly helpful. The hardest lesson I've learned has probably been related to financial literacy. I've, I've never received any financial literacy in high school, in university. I don't know why they teach it now, but I, but I just, I know that as a first generation, there's a huge generational wealth gap. And then you're trying to uh, ascend to these levels from an education standpoint so you can break that barrier. But then also from a cultural standpoint, it's your responsibility to take care, like take care of your, like, you know, and so it's that strange dynamic. Um, so I would say, yeah, one of the, one of the things I learn is, you know, um, from an economic standpoint, how I can um, help uh, myself and my situation uh, while also sustaining the things that I'm trying to build. So with Canleads, for example, like, like Canleads, we're all like we've all been volunteers for the last um, eight or nine or eight or nine years, really just doing this and and maybe breaking even uh, just because of what we wanted to um, su support in terms of building building those pathways for women. Um, but I would say that's that's probably the biggest and the one that I'm that I'm striving to continue to learn more of. Perfect. So the next question is, do you feel overwhelmed to be an advocate um, for so many women and black people? How do you deal with this responsibility? Is it overwhelming? Yes, uh, it absolutely is. 
I, to be honest with you, I think um, the timely break that we had this Christmas, I think was huge for me just from a mental um, capacity standpoint, a mental health standpoint. Um, when COVID hit, I was up, I was here in Anaganesh, so I, I live alone. Uh, and um, I, my mom told me, you know, there's no way you're heading back here with, with COVID. And so I kind of was uh, just dealing with a lot, with a, with a lot that we're seeing in the media. And I think a lot of uh, people of color and allies can, can kind of relate what to do, how to do it. Um, you know, and then just also struggling, like, again, as a, a, as a female, right? Like in terms of understanding who I can talk to. And um, I think the greatest thing that has happened is with everything, with COVID happening and everyone's response being, well, these social connections have to happen online now. It's been incredible for me because I've been able to create uh, different sport circles, some partially because we're working together on some of these amazing initiatives and some have come from um, just just the visibility piece, right? Like finding people that can relate to the position that you're in. Uh, so. That's, that's kind of one way I'm dealing with it is it's, I'm constantly communicating with others. I've also been really fortunate here at St. FX that we've been full on in person. So I've been teaching all year. Uh, we're, we've been practicing five times a week. Like currently we're on a hiatus so the athletes can kind of focus on their schoolwork uh, before classes are done. But like, that's been great for me as well. Just knowing I'm heading into work, I'm doing something, you know, I'm not, I'm not just kind of staring at a brick wall. And then lastly, I've been very intentional about how I start my days. And I never really was that kind of person. I'm, I, I usually am, you know, the alarm goes off. I jump, I jump out of bed and I'm just like, what's next, what's next? And uh, I found in the last year and a half, I really started to look within. Um, my relationship uh, with Christ has strengthened. And every day I start with Bible study. And it has been just, uh, um, it's been huge for me, like just for uh, feeling at peace, just for understanding, okay, these are the things that I gotta do. I mean, of course, as a coach, you start to learn, you know, different ways to do things more efficiently. So I, I quickly learned, especially jump into the youth sport level, like you got to have your, you got to list everything down, like what's going on today, what's got to get done. Like that stuff, yes, that's come, but I really think it's come back from being reflective. Okay, how can I, how, how can I build some, some uh, standards of how I'm going to practice self-care, right? And so for me, that's really started with, you know, how I start my days. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think I've also myself, I can relate to the routine thing, just getting in the habit, especially mm. in Ontario right now, we're still nothing's there's no in person or anything um, like that. So mm. we're all on zoom. Uh, so I think that's really important that people should take away is the routine and getting in that and waking up and having that routine every single day. So mm -hmm. we'll have one more question. And then you can return to your presentation. And then we'll finish uh, the questions at the end. But what are your hopes for the future of women in sports or youth sports? My hope, I have a lot of hopes. I'm a dreamer, call me a dreamer. Um, I know the question for like athletic financial words or scholarships has, has been a big one. I would like to see um, the proportion of funding put towards male sports, put towards female sports as well. And I'm not an authority in this and knowing exactly how it works at a nuanced level. I can say in my short time as a youth sport coach, it's just been very apparent to me where some of these gaps are. Um, you know, like the, like what is the standard? Like how can we build our sport, our, our sport world out? I've also realized though that like we have an amazing product here at the youth sport level. And I think there's, um, there's incredible opportunities for us to market our student athletes, um, market our coaches, market our brand. Um, from kind of bringing in these different spaces of our sector, whether it's government, whether it's those things. So I would like to see us at a level where, like if I wanted to, you know, in September, watch any game at the Canadian college uh, or university level, I know I'm going to this very one place. I know I'm going to this specific place. Um, I would like to see a standard of supports for every team in every department. And so ranging from, I know it looks different at every school, but like an academic advisor that is for student athletes at every school, not just some. Um, I would like to see like a standard of, um, of what, um, sorry, the word escapes me, from a practitioner support, from a mental health support. I would like to see that extend beyond the singular coaches, 
Um, and so one of the things I can say is as a young coach, like for my first two years, I was really fortunate to have like an assistant who also was balancing two jobs and three kids and trying to make things happen. And so it was really, really overwhelming for me just as a first time coach. And so I, I think there's a, I think there's a lot of barriers uh, with, um, with how we do sport and, and mainly because every institution looks so different and then every conference it looks different. And then where does the responsibility really lie, right? Like, does it lie on the whole school? Does it lie on the department? Does it, lie on, does it rely on youth sports? And um, owing to where we're at now, we've been talking a lot about equity. I know almost everyone has heard about what happened with the NCAA in the tournament, and that's not anything new. That's not COVID specific. That's just, that is how it's been. But how can we in our youth sports landscape and our CCA landscape provide more opportunities, right? Like, so Steph, your question was even about youth sports, but even on our CCA levels, our college levels, like you wouldn't believe half of the challenges that coaches have and, and athletes by default of that have and where some of those gaps are. You know, there are coaches right now that, that not only are they not able to coach, they can't even formally support their athletes. So I think, it, I know I didn't answer your question with one specific answer, but there's so many different things. And, and I see this as opportunities for growth. So am I, I'm, I'm jumping back into my yeah, presentation. Yeah, you're going to jump back into your presentation and then we have about 10 minutes and then, Ooh. yes. Okay, goes, okay, that's awesome. Yes, if that's would, okay with you. I would you. like to. Yeah, I'll fly through the rest of the rest of the slides here, and it actually works out well. I'm not saying I did it on purpose, but I could talk less about myself and answer <laughs> questions. Uh, so screen share here, and then play from current. Uh, okay, awesome. Uh, so this screen you're looking at here are different um, aspects of our sport and sport supporting community that has really responded um, in, in these events and these challenges that we, that we are currently undergoing. Many of them related to COVID and being in the midst of a global pandemic, but then also like understanding that, you know, what does this look like for people of color, right? Um, the United Nations has declared uh, this decade as a people, as a decade for people of, of African descent. But I wanted to acknowledge this isn't by any means to show a comprehensive list of, of who's doing what, but um, I'm just, I, want, I wanted to say this, I'm incredibly proud of how our sport community in Canada specifically has responded to the call to action for underrepresented groups like women, uh, like people of color, uh, while everything has been heightened um, with COVID. So uh, the Canadian Center for Mental Health and Sport um, through the BCCA, we were able to partner with and, uh, and launch a Black Student Athlete Mental Health Fund for, um, for student athletes identifying as Black at Canadian colleges and universities. Um, professional sport leagues and amateur leagues have also stepped up and have been using their platforms. And shout out to the WNBA. Um, we've had a lot of people using individual platforms. You know, Charles Casey, a former youth sport coach, actually, you know, has a podcast uh, really talking about uh, issues uh, related to intersectionality uh, for BIPOC individuals. Um, there's been an empowerment for young women that I would like to see us keep keep riding this wave and making sure that this stays at the forefront. Um, and then, you know, like again, in our sport governing bodies, being able to keep that message going. Um, I'm just going to flip through these couple of slides here so I can get back with you guys. But uh, through the BCCA platform specifically, we have really had a call to action centered around collecting race-based data, which is something that our Canadian sport community really has never done. And so what we found is from an advocacy standpoint, from an education standpoint, from an anti-racism standpoint, um, because of the lack of education, that has also led to a lack of accountability. And this uh, certainly has had an impact on recruitment and retention uh, for, for, for people in sport, for women in sport, um, for, for people of color and so forth. And then I think part of part of the beauty of this uh, of this time that we're in has also been geared towards um, telling stories and understanding people's stories and how how can our stories impact one another and where do they intersect, right? And how do we how do we um, push those paths forward? Uh, so ultimately, um, I want to go back and and look at kind of 
how I started, which was the power that we have through sport, which is to come together, which is to lead, which is to create these uh, platforms for connections, whether it be over Zoom, <laughs> whether it be in person at, at, uh, at sport camps, like regardless of where those intersections may be. Um, we've seen incredible uh, response from our sport community, specifically in the Canadian context, while we've been going through this COVID period. And I wanted to share with everyone my formula for success. It's not mine, I'm not trademarking it. I definitely got it from a book I read <laughs> and it's been reinforced. Um, but E plus R equals O, when things happen, we control the response. So we may not be responsible for them, but we are response able to them. Right, and um, understanding that we're here to really talk about those pathways for women. I think everyone just needs to keep at the forefront. Um, we wanna make sure, I, I was reading a statistic the other day and it actually said that uh, COVID has put women back in the workplace and by definition in every other aspect of our economy, something like 30 years, right? And so we wanna make sure that we're thinking about these things and thinking about them in an equitable lens, in a diversity um, inclusive lens. Right, and then we also want to understand that um, equality is not the same as equity. And I know this year, especially for me, I'm sure for anyone on this call, it's been about a lot of learning, right? Can we learn to acknowledge things that are happening and have happened? Can we accept them uh, and accept the roles that we've played, whether um, intentionally or unintentionally? And then can we align what we intend to do starting today, right? How, how we intend to move forward in achieving uh, that, that equality or sorry, that equity to equality. Um, and then I know this is a little bit of a cliche to say, but you know, don't just invite people to the party, invite them to dance, right? So diversity is not inclusion, equality is not equity. And I think as a, as a sports advocate, you're constantly thinking about those things. It's who are we leaving out uh, when we make these decisions? Um, what's been also uh, an amazing reinforcement is that Sport Canada from a formal top-down standpoint has targeted 2035 as this, as this aim for achieving gender equity in sport at every level. And so I'm really, really excited. So I wanted to end off on one of those. Well, thank you. We're gonna get back into questions. Uh, so Nikki says, your role at St. Effects is so important and inspiring. Being the first coach who is women, a woman at St. Effects and a woman of color, did you face systemic barriers upon rebuilding your program? Yes, Nikki, I have. <laughs> and, and you know, like, I'm, I, like I gotta be honest, I, I have been really privileged in my sport journey, um, especially up to the point of coming to St. FX. And, I, and I, I mean, I have privileges right now, but again, I felt like I always had a really great inner circle growing up in the guy side, knowing the right people. Um, I think the change figuratively and literally of moving to a different province, um, being young, being a female, being black, being an outsider, um, a lot of these things, uh, I don't know if I could have prepared for them, but I certainly was naive to them. Uh, and um, I, I think, yeah, it's, uh, the, the, an the answer is, is yes, in a lot of ways. Um, and I don't think, and, and I know that my experience isn't, isn't unique. That's something that I've I found out over the last few years. And it has me always thinking about my why, right? My why goes back to servicing athletes. My why goes back to um, being being a positive uh, role model and being that representation for other young women. My role also goes back to being intentional about creating uh, pathways uh, for young women who look like me and who are trying to accomplish uh, similar goals. Uh, because if I didn't receive that help, I wouldn't be here today. Um, you know, and so even in facing these systemic barriers, as much as we're trying to break them down, I know that there's been incredible response, you know, from my institution, from our athletic department, uh, from different places in our sport community uh, to, to, to address some of these gaps. I think that's really important too, and just recognizing that we want more generations, like our generations before us are mm -hmm. coming, um, younger than us um, to not have to deal with as many barriers as we currently face. So that's really important. Um, so our next question is from Caitlin and she says, if you were to be remembered for one thing as at your time as being head coach at CNFX, what would you want it to be? Embracing diversity of thought. And 
I found like just my journey through sport and I guess through life up until this point, I've always looked at things through a different perspective, usually like lesser than, but but always like, you know, what's what are we not saying? Like what's what's like you know, how can we challenge the status quo? And I think I think in in being here at St. FX and in in me being a woman of color. Um, here in the Maritimes and, and having a, an incredible opportunity to coach these young women. I think that's part of shaking that up. But I want to be remembered for diversity of thought. Uh, I want to be remembered for having a positive impact on our sport community. I, I, I truly feel like that's God's purpose for me here. And so I, I think that's why it's so hard for me to say what's my favorite coaching moment or anything like that. Um, but it would definitely be for bringing a, a, a diversity of thought to how we do sport. Well, thank you so much, uh, Leanna, for sharing your experiences and knowledge with us. Uh, I wish we obviously had more time, um, but I truly appreciated learning about the different ways that women can get involved to becoming a sport activist. And I really liked the cliche comment when you said, don't just invite people to the party, invite them to dance. I think that's so important just to make sure that everyone's included and making sure that we really practice equity, diversity, and inclusion. So thank you so much. Um, so now everyone who's in this call can just exit and go to the sessions button uh, just to click to the next live event, which begins at 1.50. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks, Emily. Thank you, Vicky, Coach Vicky. Wow, no tech issues. This is a first. <laughs> it's exciting. Everything worked out perfectly. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was very inspiring. No, this definitely made my Saturday. I love the keynote. Um, love the keynote. I think it set an amazing tone. And then I was on a really cool panel discussion earlier. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. And you did a good cool too. What year are you in? I'm in my last year at Western. I'm on the golf team. And then I'm going to go to UFT Ooh. next year. Um, yes, to do my master's of public policy. So hopefully wow. I'll be the, one of the women to face and make new policies. And You will be. Yeah. There's, so, yes. there's no hope. It's already done. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so it's exciting. Have a great weekend, okay? You too. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.